hypnotized What's up is down, what's left is right Chasing stars and holding view I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Welcome to today's stream. Um, I realise that uh, the more I kind of do these, the less I'm sort of really introducing myself. So I kind of wanted to do a bit of that today. Um, and I apologise, I'm kind of looking up a bit more. Um, hello, Jennifer, and hello, Hans Christian Swartz in the chat. Welcome. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I kind of wanted to do a little introduction of myself. Um, I my name is Claire, and uh, I'm the ethical tailor. Oh, as you can see, um, I uh, am a, a, a tailor. Um, I do mostly alterations in my day job, and I also teach sewing skills, which then leads me onto uh, YouTube with some demonstration videos and um, kind of the series that I've been doing on here talking about the dark side of fashion um, and then today we're going to actually be talking about art um, so as you can see behind me I've got some of my own art um, so that's kind of what I do in my spare time um, to, to sort of uh, down um, wind down from a day of sewing uh, a lot of people come to me saying that they like to sew because that's kind of good for their mental health whereas I actually find that painting is good for myself um so and today's stream is actually going to be talking to another um fellow artist um the artist that's actually um exhibiting uh, I'm very very new to sort of exploring um uh, my art more sort of semi-professionally I suppose um as opposed to when I was studying it um back at college um so yeah so today we have the SB chef um who uh sort of real name is Samuel uh so let me grab him on screen hey Samuel hello everyone hello hello <laughs> wonderful cool so um for uh, sort of anyone that hasn't, uh, that doesn't know your full story, um, just to let them know that I have actually linked um, two of the uh, videos that you've done with Jeff, uh, PTS for Life, in the description of this video. So you can always go and uh, look at them for a deeper dive into uh, Samuel's story. But today we're going to be just um, exploring his artistic side um, and kind of his life around that really <laughs> um fabulous so to start um do you want to sort of uh go into a bit of your art background and kind mm -hmm. of um where you started uh kind of until now in a very sort of brief description sure um okay. so i have um well when i was in kindergarten i there were these blocks of uh, these wooden blocks that you would play around with. I'm sure you you know what I mean, right? I'm sure you had that internationally in all the kindergarten. By the way, I am from Switzerland. That's uh, where I live. That's where I was born and grew up. And when I was a child, I was fascinated with fascinated with symmetry. So I would build uh, towers. I would build things like that, arches and all of that. When I was in kindergarten, it had to be all uh, symmetrical. And I was fascinated with that. So I suppose that is sort of the first thing where it sort of started. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, obviously, I would paint a little bit here and there, but no, with no guidance, really, as a, as a child. And then uh, later on, when I moved to England, when I was 13 years old, when I was about 15 years old, uh, we had actually an art teacher come to, our, to the school that I attended at the time for just one lesson. 
and her name was Liz uh, and Liza. And uh, she showed us several different art styles. And there was one art style that she introduced, which was called taking a line for a walk. Mm. And the whole idea of it was you have uh, your sheet of paper, your canvas, whatever it is. And then you just take up, pick up a pen and you just go for it. And you just make any sort of shapes, um, very rounded shapes. And then at the end, you just connect the line back to the beginning of it. And mm. then you just, and you just simply decide what's there and then you paint it out. And that sort of was the idea of that. Um, yeah. Do you want to maybe show the, that one picture? I was picture going to say, you, that was the picture that you sent me, wasn't yeah. it? Let me grab that's that right. That's right. That's me. Here we go. I'm the, I'm the good looking one and the, the only one you can actually recognize. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And, and uh, that's lies you can see there. And uh, that, that, uh, that drawing that I'm holding, I don't have this anymore because uh, when I left uh, England, I came back to Switzerland. I, I didn't take anything with me. But I remember this, this one, it was called The Opera Singer. I remember oh, that. Nice. Yeah. And um, that sort of started uh, my style that I have now because I was very fascinating, fascinated by that. And I've been um, doing little experiments with that in the sense that I've been listening to music and try to be influenced by music. So by the, the speed of the music, the emphasis on certain notes, and then move my hands differently according to wow. whatever I'm listening to. So if I listen to more, uh, shall we say, energetic music, like if I were to listen to rock or whatever, they're much more uh, smaller, um, uh, smaller loops or smaller spaces because obviously I would move faster because the mu music is faster. And if I listen to, you know, like Chopin or something a bit more uh, low key, the, the, my hand movement would be much larger, much more uh, spacious. And um, so I started to, 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 to do that sort of thing. And I've been um, experimenting with different materials. I like to use metals in my, in my paintings, just wood chips eggshells, uh, anything really to make, to try to make it more three-dimensional because it's very flat, the kind of art that I do. There are no, there are no um, shadows, there are no anything like that. It's very flat, very 2D. And with, mm. with these materials that I use into my art, I try to make it a bit more three-dimensional as well as obviously convey hidden messengers with that. And yeah. um, in regards to any sort of... Uh, Hello there, witness. Uh, and hello there, Hans, of course, and yeah. uh, Jennifer, and anyone else who's watching. And um, so I haven't gone to actually art school. Mm. I wanted to go to art school uh, when I was in Switzerland, but then I looked at how much it costs and I thought better of it. Mm. And I was actually working in Austria. I am, I am a trained chef. I went to culinary school here in, in Switzerland. And I was working in Austria in, uh, in the mountains during the winter in 2019. And then, so the season was 2019 until spring 2020. And obviously during that time, the pandemic happened. And then I had to return to Switzerland. I was not allowed to stay there because they had to close down the hotel and all of that. So then I returned back to Switzerland. And naturally I wasn't able to work because all the restaurants were, were closed. So what did I do with my little self? I went to a uh, secondhand bookstore that I have right down my street. It's, it's, a, it's a great place where you can buy very expensive art books that usually would cost a hundred pounds for like 10 pounds or something. So I decided to sort of educate myself in that way. So I went there and I bought technical art books, which uh, you know, would explain how to, uh, how to paint different techniques, uh, how do you make oil colors? What are oil colors exactly? Understand the layering of it, because when you paint with oil color, you, you paint one layer and then the next layer, the next layer. Why do you do that? How do you do that exactly? Uh, using acrylics, different other uh, materials. Also understanding um, what, is, what are warm colors, cold colors? Why do certain colors clash with each other? And things like that. Because yeah. before that, also in the uh, picture that you showed, the, that what I made was was just in black, white, and gray, and from that point onwards until 
2020, I had been painting only in gray colors, never in any, in, never in proper colors, because I was almost too intimidated by it. Because I just, uh, you know, I thought, you know, okay, sure, I know these like red and yellow, okay, they look nice together. But I was just afraid to really experiment because I didn't want to ruin the painting. And that is yeah. obviously the, the worst thing you can do uh, when you're creative to fear to make a mistake. That's the whole point of being creative, mm -hmm. that you make mistakes and you need to say, you know what, who cares? Just go for it. And if it's not good, that's fine. You can just paint over it if it's a canvas. You know, canvases are expensive, but that's fine. You can scrape off the paint, paint over it and just start again. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but I sort of had to get over myself to, to do that. And because I am also a little bit of a perfectionist, which yeah. obviously doesn't help. Um, <laughs> it's very useful in the kitchen, but it's not very useful um, when you want to be, uh, you know, painting, particularly mm -hmm. uh, abstract art. And um, yeah, so that's sort of my way of how I got into, into that. And then I realized I actually really like painting and it helped with my mental health as well, you know. And um, I thought to myself, well, maybe I want to do this a little bit more seriously. So I said to myself, all right, Samuel, you have 365 days. I gave myself one year to do this more seriously. And then after one year, see where I stand and what is my relationship with it. Because at this point, it was just a hobby. And mm -hmm. as many people may know, if you have a hobby, it's a nice thing. You can just sort of pick up every once in a while or whatever. But if it is something that you do very intensively, and it doesn't really become a hobby anymore. It becomes almost like a work. Is it this? Is it as enjoyable then? Yeah. Or is it, does it become work? Is it just only work and you lose the fun out of it because you just do pick it up randomly without any obligation? But if you do it more professionally, maybe there are people expecting things. You have appointments. You have an art gallery that demands 12 paintings. Th these sort of things, like how does that work for me how is my relationship to art then will it change will i hate painting because now it's suddenly work in that sort of sense sense so i said to myself okay one year i really have to be taking this very seriously which i did i i uh, started an instagram channel where um a, a account i mean where i would uh, po post those things i went to art um exhibition i ex exhibited my my art i started to sell art uh, I started to talk to other artists, to to buyers or people who were interested and just sort of talk about that and sort of try and tip my toe into the art world. And um, I also um, made up a website for my uh, art where people can also buy the art and so on and so forth. And um, so I did this for one year. And after one year, I realized, you know what, actually, I do very much like this. And so I've been continuing since then. And uh, right now I've stepped back a little bit from art uh, because of different things that have happened in my family. And because of work, I have just started to work in this new place in January. So it's my third month. And oh, wow. I want to focus more on this so I can, I'm really much more comfortable so that I have the time afterwards to do more art. And uh, I recently also started uh, my YouTube channel. So I'm also pouring uh, stuff in there. But uh, I still have yeah. two um, art projects that I'm working on because um, the problem is I always have to limit myself when I do art. What I mean by that is I always give myself series. I always make an art series. And then I say, all right, this art series has eight paintings, has 12 paintings. I can only use this material. I can only do it this way or that way to limit myself a little bit because my art is very abstract. There's no just comes out of my head pretty much so there's no limit of what i can do rather than realism yeah. you know if i have a flower in front of me and uh, I, I just and i want to paint what is right in front of me the only way you can really change is maybe if you put a light somewhere to change the shadows mm. and then that way you might influence it but it's still limited to what is there right and yeah. and with my art i don't have this physical limitation because it's all coming from up here so i have to give myself sort of a handicap in a way giving myself all right you have to you cannot do it like this you have to do it like that and and that sort of um helps me to stay focused rather than i like that painting a painting and never be finished with it because i'm just like i just don't know where am i going with this so i i like to define the end product before i start it 
it's very strange because it's contradictory because it's very organized in a way it has yeah. to be done this way that way but on the other hand it's very freestyle and just i have no idea how the painting is going to look on the end mm. in the end right so it's it's a bit con um um contradicting each other but yeah so that's that pretty much oh yeah that's really interesting because yeah i'm sort of uh, more of a realist painter Mm. um and I kind of have yeah had people sort of say to me oh you know why don't you kind of um sort of mirror things out a bit more because I'm like can be like so realist sometimes that mm -hmm. I don't see the oddities in sort of bits um right. yeah and then it isn't until sort of like I go and maybe sort of look back at work um to maybe sort of finish it off that then I can do that sort of um thinking outside the box with it in a way. Mm -hmm. So um, sort of, I always really admire people that kind of paint either sort of just from kind of something in their mind or sort of as with you sort of painting with like with sort of within the music and things like that. Um, mm. Yeah, I find that really sort of um, enjoyable to sort of hear about the process because I've uh, never, never come from that uh, sort of in myself I've always been um, yeah even in sort of like drawing when I was at uh, sort of senior school and things it was always like copying cartoon characters and things like that right okay so that's mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. fascinating to hear your um, your sort of journey into it and I wanted to bring up uh, I think it's this one um, because I was really fascinated when you were talking about the pieces of metal and the eggshell and that because mm -hmm. I've seen these um, pictures on your website with the sort of uh, paper um, sort of background as it is. So I'm guessing, is this what you have done? You've done the sort of speckles on the background mm -hmm. and then you've painted over it or do you, um, or do you buy the paper like that? No, what I do, I make my own primer and then right. in the primer, I add whatever material that I wish to. In this case, this is the, the Wondrous Fruit Tree. Uh, and it is part of my series Metallica, which hasn't anything to do with the band, but because I took nine different metals and wow. with each one of the metals, I painted three paintings. So the series has wow. 27 paintings, which was exhausting. Let me tell I you, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm never going to make a, a series this large again, although never say never, but it was quite you know, it was quite something because also mm. 12 of these paintings were uh, were made for uh, an exhibition. But I didn't mm. know which ones yet because, of course, I didn't know how they're going to look. So uh, very much yeah. like when you do a fashion collection, you sort of you do out loads and loads of designs yeah. and then you yeah. narrow it down. And then you know which ones, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, and in this case here, I used um, aluminium. So I took just very simply aluminium foil and i cut it up in small little pieces and i and i mix it into the primer and this is the little metal flashes you see in the background right yeah oh amazing that's so cool because yeah i was like trying to tell if it was like on top of the um painting or underneath so right no it's really... it's basically underneath because, yeah underneath, but the primer yeah. the primer i use is quite thin because right. if it's too thick, it will cover it completely up, the, the yeah. whatever metal or material. So I do want it uh, to, to show a little bit that it is there. Yeah. Nice. Fabulous. Uh, so let me take that down. So, um, wonderful. So let's, um, so uh, sort of in my, in my list of questions, um, <laughs> I'm trying not to be too uh, sort of, pragmatic on but I've got um sort of like what's your favorite art materials and styles so obviously we have uh, we'll go back to the first picture that I sort of um oh no actually sorry there's oh no I think I put it on there. that's fine oh um, yeah so we'll go back to the first one that I picked out so I sort of picked out this mm. one um yeah. that was quite interesting um but yeah sort of um so a lot of your paintings seem to be sort of with um like acrylic uh, painting uh, yeah. sorry acrylic as the paint medium um mm. 
Uh, but would you say that's sort of your favorite or that's just kind of the one that you're um, using at the moment? Uh, it is my favorite simply because it dries so quickly. Yeah, I, same. <laughs> when, I when, I, when I first uh, started to, to learn about um, uh, uh, painting and colors and things like that, I actually uh, I did one painting where I did all the colors from scratch. I made uh, oil colors. And I just did it not because my intention was to always do it that way because it's it's, it's so time consuming. It's quite expensive rather than just buying the finished product. But I just wanted to have done it once. And for if you have an oil painting, you have to paint in layers. And the reason for that is because when the oil paint dries, it will. If if you didn't paint in layers, well, first of all, you do layers because you want to create a, a certain effects on the painting, but you start the layers with more oil, the first layer, and then the second layer has a little bit less oil, and then a little less oil and less oil. And you do, do it that way because then while it dries, it has flexibility, it can move a little bit. And if you don't do it the right way, it will crack much quicker. Yeah. Obviously, if you have very old paintings, they will eventually will have cracks in it and that's completely natural. But if you have a painting that's only 20 years old, 30 years old, and it has cracks in it, then it probably is because it was either it wasn't stored properly, of course, or it wasn't it hasn't um, had those layers. But if you if you paint this old painting, it takes years until it's actually dry. Until it's properly dry, it will take years, and uh, which has a benefit in the sense of you can start it, put it aside, start another project, and then sort of pick up the other one and then continue with that one. So that sort of gives you the flexibility of doing that for sure. And with yeah. acrylic, that's a bit more difficult because obviously it dries much quicker. But I, 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 I like to, yeah, because I have this tendency of perfect, uh, of um, uh, being a perfectionist. I, at the beginning, I had difficulty to say, "All right, this painting is done now." I just kept on picking it up and just making it worse or worse or whatever. You know, it's like it's something that you learn in in culinary school. Like if you make a mistake, uh, there are certain mistakes you just leave it you just leave it on trying to yeah. to to uh, trying to make it better because it will just make it worse worse and then you have to start all over again and so i decided once i finish a painting and i'm done and i think to myself all right it's fine let me put it aside i'm going to look at it later then i just put a primer on uh, another primer a um a varnish i put the varnish on it directly because it, then it's done yeah and it sort of stops me from wanting to perfect it or whatever yeah Definitely, definitely. No. I, I am a, I'm a terrible one for that, um, especially because when no. I uh, use um, acrylic, I sort of, because I really like, yeah, like you say, sort of um, oil for that fact that you can kind of keep working into it. Mm. But obviously, you know, it's quite smelly. It's um, sort of, well, it true. can be rather yeah. messy. Mm. So it's sort of harder to use in that way, um, especially when I work in my bedroom um, doing my painting. Um, mm. And then I like sort of uh, watercolour for the sort of fluidness of it. Yeah. Um, mm. So, you know, kind of best of both worlds, I use acrylic um, to sort of try and slow myself down because I tend to be a very much I want to kind of finish a painting in a day, which doesn't mm -hmm, always mm -hmm. get the best results. Um, but also, uh, sort of, um, allows me to kind of sort of work at my, um, uh, sort of quality of work, you know, sort of, um, overall. So, yeah, yeah. so I really, uh, I really like acrylic too. Um, just mm. say hello to Brad. Oh, hey. hello, Brad, that darling. <laughs> He's watching at two times speed to catch up. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, so um, also uh, in kind of talking about styles, I brought home my book of Miro. Oh, because, Miro. Um, yes. That was obviously who your style of painting really uh, sort of represents to me. Um, mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure if that was your sort of influence through your style um if i kind of go through to some others um mm. for your sort of style of painting um or uh yeah or sort of kind of if there was anyone else as a influence um like another artist as an influence 
Well, actually, it's funny because, um, as I said, I, I have painted in this sort of style, although not with color, uh, since about I'm 14, 15 years old, something like that. And only when I was during the pandemic and I was I was looking at, uh, at artists and things like that, did I discover Miro? Did I discover Paul Klee? Did I discover Kandinsky uh, and uh, Cubism? And I sort of realized, oh, there's a lot in, in what I do is, is I can see that also in there. So I wouldn't say that it's inspired by them because I wasn't really, I mean, to say I wasn't aware of them. I mean, who hasn't heard of Picasso, you know? But I wasn't really um, aware of, of the connection there really. Only after I, I've, I've researched it a little bit and sort of figured that out, I was like, oh, wow, interesting. Actually, this seems to be an, uh, an art style or something similar to that for a while. And interestingly enough, all of these people that, that we just mentioned, they all lived during around the same time, the beginning of the yeah. 20th century, which is fascinating to me that, I mean, of course, they may have known each other, but not all of them knew each other. And, yeah. uh, and uh, for example, Paul Klee, he's, he's a Swiss artist, and there are only maybe three paintings of this that I saw that are in the sort of style that I also do. And so it almost seems like that's something that maybe was popular back then, or it was like something um, to try out. And, yeah. and, and, but then, but it never really took off completely in the sense that there was an artist who only this, this, so, this sort of painting. And during this research, I was trying to figure out maybe there's a name for this kind of art that I do, like for example, cubism, you know, mm. and uh, there's a certain, uh, category some sort of name for that but i haven't found anything if anybody knows i'd be glad to know so i know <laughs> what i'm actually doing um but yeah but yeah i mean i'm still inspired by them because i um there's a painting i did it's called the physician and it is a it, it is a style of painting i don't know what the technical word is in 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 english but translated it would mean uh be painting behind glass Oh, so yes. You paint on glass, but the trick is that you have to paint in a reverse fashion. I think because I picked out this one. Oh, is yes, this, this one. one. Yeah, I really this, like this yeah. for that yeah. sort of 3D effect. 3D effect. And I, I, I had it framed. I have a I have a, a, a framer which also lives on the same street. She's brilliant. Oh, and um, and I always bring all my paintings all get all framed by her. And uh, I made her frame this in a way so that it is slightly raised so that mm. a shadow is fo falls onto the background. And because of the style of painting with painting on glass, the colors are much more vibrant because they're completely flat. Yeah. When you, when you paint on paper or canvas, you have, you have time. I mean, you don't really perceive it maybe with your eyes. The, the lines of it, the little bumps yeah. and things like that, which which give maybe slight shadows or whatever. But if you paint on glass, it is completely flat, and it it, it just it, the colors pop much more than uh, than in any other way. And this is this yeah. is yeah, this is one of those paintings I did, and then I did a, a very large one like that uh, called the physician, and that is a little bit more inspired by uh, Kandinsky. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have, because I have learned about these um, artists, I have obviously looked at what they have done and, and tried to pick up some ideas from that and sort of just try it out, you know, and yeah. allow myself to make a mistake, which is so important for an artist. I mean, for anyone in, in, any, in any job, really. I mean, you should be yeah. in an environment that allows uh, and permits mistakes. Um, because I think as so long as you can learn from these mistakes, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But of course, if if you have, but if you are on your own, like for example, like we are on our own, so we have to give ourselves the permission. And sometimes yeah. that's a bit hard. It's harder to give ourselves permission to do something bad in the sense than if somebody else takes the responsibility of you doing something bad. But it's important to uh, remember that, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. I think sort of I kind of like with sort of clothing. Obviously, it's so easy to kind of once you've sewn apart to sort of go back and unpick it and then like start right. again mm -hmm. um finally like you don't rip the fabric in the meantime but you know obviously sort of there is then a difference with 
sort of how you um uh face setting away with sort of painting because it's um it's kind of yeah like you said before it's either sort of kind of scraping it off if you can um or sort of painting over it and obviously sort of which is always seems like such an easy task to do but actually mm. to do it to your you know like to over like your own painting even if you don't like yeah. it it's so yeah. hard um yeah. because you may think oh i can still save it but maybe yeah. right now i don't know how maybe now i don't know how but maybe later on i know and then you sort of don't know as you said it becomes difficult do, do you want to paint over it or you know yeah yeah exactly mm. it's that sort of um how um yeah because even sort of kind of depending on the um sort of uh medium and sort of background that you might be sort of working on as a canvas might depend sort of how kind of um raised that uh sort of painting is and things like that um mm. as to you know then sort of like kind of what surface then like you've got to work with afterwards yeah. um but yeah i think that like you say sort of it's kind of it's part of that process and and it's about sort of learning to work with that process um yeah, yeah so i think that's it's really nice and i mm. think that kind of um it's potentially sort of why it kind of create you know it's creative um arts are quite good sort of for like mental health and things like that because we sort of go around in life um, this is kind of how I see it anyway, you know, like we go around in life sort of being like everything is so black and white. Um, whereas actually sort of when you do something creative and like and then you make a mistake, you might sort of really kind of curse yourself and uh, sort of think how much of a disappointment you are. But actually, you know, then you just paint over it or you just take something apart and start again. Yes, you know, it's it's time taken but you know you can always make a change and I think it's sort of quite healthy to then sort of like think about that for ourselves in our own lives of sort of how do we um how could we have maybe changed something that we did um and sort of move forward from it in that sort of sense um yeah. it's sort it of interesting and, like and how you sort of, yeah like how you sort yeah. of kind of like where it's only like when I'm like talking to other people about this that I sort of start thinking these things and I'm like oh actually you know it's sort of quite uh um yeah like all these sort of different uh angles and sort of parts can come out of these processes yeah so that uh yeah I think that's quite um yeah quite quite an interesting way to go about it um Absolutely. so um so yes, yeah, so I kind of wanted to touch on um, because I know that your um, uh, art journey sort of started um, when you were part of Scientology. Um, mm. And I was just sort of interested um, because there's a lot of people whose stories we hear about and they um, have been in such sort of like coercive controlling groups um, and how they weren't maybe able to be more sort of creative in such ways so mm. i was kind of interested sort of how you came about doing that within scientology um and sort of how it maybe helped you through the process of being part of such um uh destructive organization <laughs> Mm, is that something that you right. don't mind going into <laughs> no absolutely absolutely that's fine yeah so i uh, i mentioned that i left uh, switzerland to go to england uh, when i was 13 years old and this was to work for scientology in the so-called sea org and um between 13 and 16 i attended a scientology school there which was run by sea org members as well and it was, um, I wouldn't say I had a great education there because we were sort of, it was just self-study and we were sort of left on our own devices. And the, we had one teacher and then we had one school in charge, basically. And I don't know if they had any background in education or anything like that. Um, in any case, it was not exactly... Um, 
you know, I mean, we had mathematics, we had geography and things like that, but it was all on, on self-study. And I don't think, well, it wasn't particularly great. And when we had, for example, art lesson, it was just sort of like, well, just go in there and just do something. But there was no like direction. There was no, uh, no guidance or anything. And this with all of the, of the different uh, subjects in school. And then this one time, because one of the students that was there, his mother, uh, this was Liza, she uh, was, uh, I believe, an art uh, teacher or she, she in, was involved in some way with art before she joined the Sea Org. And then wow. she, she was allowed to be there for one day, for one lesson, to uh, talk a little bit about art and so on and so forth and different art styles. And then that's where it started, where I, I worked on this kind of art style. And then until I was 16 years old, I attended the school. So every time there was an art lesson, I don't know how often I was a week, probably a couple of times, I would then work on this sort of art because I, I felt very comfortable with this sort of art. And I did it until I was about 16. And then from 16 years old, I had to join the proper force in, uh, in, the, in Scientology, in the Sea Org, where I would work uh, 100 hours a week. Um, and so I had no time to paint at all. Like during 16 and 20, uh, because I left with 20 and came back to Switzerland, I, I didn't paint mm. at all. I didn't do anything like that yeah. because I had absolutely no capacity, no, no time to do anything like that at all. And then only once I came back to, to Switzerland and I started to work here, I uh, did my military service. And then after that, I sort of realized it took a, a long time to allow myself to do something useless. And what I mean by yeah. that is in Scientology, there's always a lot of focus on a productivity that whatever it is that you do has a purpose. And the purpose in Scientology is to clear the planet, whatever exactly that means, mm -hmm. and to uh, help everyone. So naturally, whatever it is that you do needs to be working towards that goal. And painting, writing poetry, for example, that's not going to bring us anywhere that on that goal. So while I was working for Scientology, naturally, it didn't even occur to me to do that because uh, it wouldn't further the purpose of, of clearing the planet, you know, of saving everyone. Uh, and then once I left uh, the Sea Org, and, but I was still very much a Scientologist. I still believed in Scientology. I just left the Sea Org when I was 20. And wow. uh, so this would have been in uh, December 2012. And then, but I would say in about 2017, by the time 2017, I was able to say to myself, no, I'm not a Scientologist anymore because I had discovered many things about it uh, that, of course, I had no access to while I was a Scientologist. And I came to realize, well, actually, it is all pretty, pretty bad. And yeah. my experience that I had, I, it was because, you see, I had a very bad experience in, in Scientology and in the Sea Org, as most people probably do. But because you're not allowed to talk about experiences, you're not allowed to have uh, intimate connections with other people. You're not, you don't have friends because you cannot trust anybody because there's snitching culture. So if, mm. if you, Claire, were to show uh, that you're unhappy with your life, then that would mean well, what crimes have you committed? Because it cannot be that you're unhappy because you're working for Scientology. So you must have committed crimes. So naturally, you would never confine with anybody. So there's no, there's nothing like that at all. And yeah. once I came out of, um, and obviously what I was trying to say with that is because you never talk to each other, you assume that all the bad stuff you're going through is just happening to you. It's just, it's just, it just so happens that it just happens to you. Uh, but later on, when I left uh, the Sea Org and I went online on YouTube and I saw other people talk about their experience, I realized, actually, I wasn't the only one. All of these people experienced pretty much the same thing and they were working for Scientology all over the world. So it wasn't mm. particularly in only this country, Scientology gets done in that way. And so all this abuse happened just in this country, but it happened all over the place. And that made me realize that actually Scientology has abuse in its DNA. It just has to do that. So that's why then I realized, oh, I'm not a Scientologist anymore. And, but because of my background in Scientology, when I left and then I was living my normal life, going to work and whatever, and I had time off suddenly. I had suddenly time off. I had time on my, times on, on my hand. And I was trying to do things to sort of 
give myself the idea as though I'm still furthering the purpose of clearing the planet, right? And I still didn't know what that meant exactly. And so <laughs> I felt guilty when I just relaxed, when I just watched a movie, when I just took a walk just for the sake of taking a walk, you know? If yeah. you take a walk, you need to be efficient. You need to do this, that, and at the same time, you know, uh, whatever. And uh, it was it was very difficult. And after a while, I just sort of got over myself with that. And I was able to pick up the brush again and and start and start again uh, with painting oh, yeah. and and yeah. And so it sort of slowly de developed into that. And um, yes. I hope that answered the question. It was a bit yeah, of a long-winded yeah, yeah. answer. Yeah, no, it, it literally, it fascinates me every time that someone says that they didn't really, they thought it was just them who mm. was yeah. like going through it. Um, yeah, it, it shocks me like so much because I've seen those sort of being an outsider, having sort of uh, watched the documentaries about it, sort of heard so many people talk about it and you're just like, no, you know, like, because I just heard, like, sort of, like, five other people saying that they go for it, that it's so shocking that you, you know, sort of even people who have kind of, who met each other within mm. still didn't realise that, like, the other one was going through similar stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah, so it's sort of, you know, it's kind of nice that of the, when sort of, you know, like, you came out, that you, um you know sort of obviously it took you time but you know sort of was able to find your art again and kind of and use that um as a force for sort of helping yourself get through a lot um mm. from from the sounds of it because uh yeah because you know sort of it's not uh it cannot be an easy um uh instance to to have gone through um yeah so yeah it's uh it's uh yeah sort of always always fascinating to hear and sort of the um like i said sort of at the start like anyone that hasn't um heard samuel's full story and um, do go and check the links in the description um to his interviews with jeff um after this uh interview um because yeah it's, it's fascinating um kind of and heartbreaking sort of the, the things that you went through um so yeah, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but yeah, like I say, I'm glad that you've got the art to sort of um, pull you through that. And mm. obviously it's lucky for you that you um, were taught that as a, at a young age, that obviously even though you had those years where you couldn't do anything, you had plenty of time before where you had sort of developed it to, for it to be able to like be stored in your brain as such, um, or your mind. Um, for you to then sort of pick up afterwards because uh yeah. and i think that sort of it's interesting because like when i was looking through your paintings um and it has about like the inspired by whatever piece mm. of music and i was like oh you know is that sort of you were listening to something at the time of painting or um or was it just you know kind of like a um sort of an artist that like I hadn't sort of heard about and things like that so uh mm -hmm. yeah so it's it's really um yeah sort of uh, an interesting journey through it all um and uh as as you were talking there was something else that I was thinking of um what to ask you and now I can't I can't think of what it was um but uh yeah I'm sure it will it will come back to me but uh, what I will do is um just throw up the images again because I had I sort of um I think that was the last one that I did um I didn't know if you kind of wanted to go through the um sort of paintings that I'd picked out and kind of maybe talk about them a bit um, sure yeah any, any <laughs> paintings that, that you that you thought were, were interesting or, or weird yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. go right ahead yeah yeah, yeah. I liked, uh, so like for me personally, I kind of picked them out because I was interested by the sort of textures um, as well as sort of the, the painting on top of them, um, mm. as well as kind of the, the, the sort of line making um, and colours and things like that. 
Um, so obviously now that I, I realise that the lines come from the music that you were listening to, um, mm-hmm. is there kind of anything else, I suppose, that you um, think about whilst you're sort of listening to the music and then painting? Or is it literally quite a subconscious thing that you're doing? I Well, I'm, I'm forcing myself to be subconscious. Well, subconscious in the sense of unconscious when I paint. What I mean by that is, um, you see, to go back, when I was in, in Scientology, there are certain things that are called training routines. And the whole purpose of that is to suppress emotions, not show emotions, and and basically make yourself go completely blank to not think of anything at all to just make you to just literally go blank you don't think of anything and i've been doing that since uh my feet were dangling off a chair so i was just like three or four years old yeah and and i basically use this ability of just going blank to paint these paintings with music so wow. what i do is i listen to a piece of music and i have the paper, cardboard, canvas, whatever it is in front of me. And I close my eyes and I just sort of sit there until I'm really into it. And Mm. then I start going with the lines. Now the trouble is if you close your eyes and you move your hand or your finger, you can visually see what your hand is doing. You see, you can see the movement of it. And yeah. if you if you see it, you might subcon you might well not subconscious, but you might consciously try to influence it maybe. Yeah. And because you can see what you're doing, right? And so the difficult part is to remove that. So I, so I don't see the lines that I'm doing, so that it is really done purely by my muscles or whatever wow. reacting to the music. Yeah. And this naturally has caused that I just threw away lots of stuff because I start doing it and then I realize, oh, I'm influenced and stop, throw it away, start uh. again. Which is why most of my paintings I paint on paper because then it's right. not such a loss because canvases are expensive, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, or, or I would just use like cardboard from, from uh, some packaging. You know, I ordered something, there's a nice bit of cardboard. Okay, perfect, let's just paint on that. Yeah. And and um, so that is another interesting thing because it's a very, very strict, it has an exact rule. And the funny thing is, if I were to show you a painting and I tell you this is how, you, how I did it, you would have no idea of knowing whether this is true or not. And I could just pretend, but I, I'm so like, like, no, if this isn't like, if it isn't like that, then it's not this art, whatever this art is called, right? And then I just get rid of it and I have to start again. And, yeah. um, but not all of my paint, I mean, mo- many, many paintings I have done are, isn't, are inspired by music. And m- I did in the beginning a lot like that. And then after a while I thought, okay, let me try to do it without music or if with music, I do it with my eyes open and see what happens if I do decide as I'm going with, with my pen, let's move it over here. Let's yeah. give it a little twirl over there. And uh, and just sort of try to move on a little bit like that, try different things. And um, that certainly makes it easier because then I don't have to throw it away every time. But yeah, um, yeah it was just sort of, I was trying to find um, uh, some sort of, again, sort of res- restraining myself, giving myself a limitation of, of what I'm doing um, to, to, yeah, to limit myself of, no, with the possibilities so that it isn't so vast. And it, it's because I, it's something, because I was very scared, if you want to call it that, of the internet for many years, because it, it's a room without walls. If you have a room with walls, you can see what's happening. If you if you turn off the light and you've never been in the room, you have no idea how large it is. And it mm. sort of, it makes me a little bit uh, uncomfortable. And in the same way with this sort of art, because I don't know where it is going, what is happening with it. And so yeah. I try to limit myself because of that as well yeah that's yeah that's really interesting but yeah I totally get what you mean um mm. yeah it's like there's sort of too many infinites um so yeah, yeah it's sort of uh yeah kind of where where do you stop otherwise 
Mm. Um, so I also wanted to find out about the um, the titles of your works. Right. So um, are they, does that also come out of sort of the images that you're seeing whilst you're painting or is it just sort of what you see after you've painted? Well, I, after I draw it, I, I, I look at it, I give myself a bit of time uh, and then I, I, things just start, I just start to see things. It's almost like a Rorschach. Yeah. You know, I just sort of start seeing something and then the first thing that I sort of recognize, I'm like, okay, this is it. And then I paint it in a way how I see it in the hopes that others see it too. Yeah. And sometimes people do, but sometimes people don't at all. And even after I po point out, oh, look, this is, this is the hand over here. This is the arm. This is the head. This is the nose. Even after I try to point out, people still can't see it, but I see it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, that is something I like about abstract art. And, and when I'm on like on an art fair or whatever, and I talk to other artists or, or people just looking at the art, uh, I will ask them, you know, don't look at the title. Just tell me what do you think it is? You know, like, what do you exactly. see in there? And it's just fascinating, like fascinating what people can see in it. Um, you know, what it means to them. You know, I've heard all sorts of things where I thought, oh my God, I wish I had come up with that. It sounds so much better. And yeah. um you know, it's 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 uh, it's really interesting, yeah. But yes, you know, for me, art exactly. art art is it, it art is supposed to talk to you. It's supposed to tell you something. It's supposed to make you feel something. And I think it's perfectly fine for for art to tell you something that the art artist maybe didn't intend, so long as it's telling you something. If it's if it's completely uh, stumm, if it's completely uh, muted, um, I don't think that is really art. It needs to tell you something. And um, I mean, that's how I see that as an artist or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like, because this one in particular, the wondrous fruit, um, fruit tree, I really mm. love it. But every time I keep looking at it, all I can see is a dog. Um, oh, so I really, that's I really yeah. like that sort of kind of when you're sort of saying about you try and sort of explain it to other people. Yeah. Um, and you know like and they don't get it whereas like i can totally see the tree in this and sort of the hanging fruit but they're still just like this dog keeps looking at me so yeah. um yeah i kind of like that sort of with art how it's sort of you know it's very up for interpretation um mm -hmm. yeah. and also i find sort of it can depend on your mood sometimes sort of how you sure. look at art um and sure. sort of how it speaks to you so, and yeah, colors I also also brilliant. will change the mood sometimes. Exactly, definitely, you know, definitely. Mm, yeah, I find that really, really, really fascinating. Um, fabulous. So I think that's kind of hit upon mostly everything that we were going to talk about. Um, mm. so I was going to go over some of our starred uh, comments. Um, yes, also sure. I'd like to say welcome. Um. Jen and Brad back up to full speed. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, there was actually a comment that I didn't. Uh, oh, I didn't star. Um, that I did want to bring up. Why did I see it? Um, that Whitney said um, that Samuel, you were very creative at such an early age um which you know i think is sort of um can be kind of um rare and not with sort of uh sort of different people you know i um have been told that i was always designing and making clothes for my barbies when i was younger yet right, i okay, had no yeah. recollection of that um mm. until like i was in sort of uh like senior school so sort of like um 14 15 and sort of drawing like cartoon characters and things um so yeah but i think that's sort of kind of similar to what obviously you were saying before about like uh using the building blocks and sort of um making art forms potentially out of them um which you know sort of i did stuff with lego and things like that um on a very sort of uh potentially sort of like similar way um but yeah i was yeah. thinking i mean i would i would even argue in most cases all children are artists and then we 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 lose that because the seriousness of life 
catches up to us or whatever and and then there are certain people who 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 pick it up again i mean i think that's yeah. that's how i see for example picasso's art because lots of his art looks like a child could have drawn that it's very yeah. it's very you know you know what i mean like without demeaning it in any sort of way and i think that is sort of the sort of thing he was trying to do that he was trying to uh be the artistic child that he once was because if yeah. you look at uh his work in 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 the uh in the in 1900 1910 1920 is much more uh strict uh much more form you can see there's more of a classical training behind it definitely more abstract for sure but what he's done then when he in in the in the 1950s and 60s that it looks much more like the sort of thing that a child would have done and i don't know what his thought process was behind that whether he was trying to do that but that is how i see that that he's sort of trying to be uh trying to bring the the artistic child that he once was back into the painting and um i mean that's how i see that anyway yeah so i do think most most children are very artistic and then maybe it just sort of gets verbally beaten out of them because yeah. being an artist is, is something useless you know you can't make money out of, with that and so on and so forth well fair enough but uh, it's still fun to do so and you never know yeah. what will happen so you know exactly exactly no yeah i think i think it's nice you know it's sort of to um sort of be like continually um exploring these parts of us sorry um yes yeah, sort mm -hmm. of be continually exploring these parts of us um to allow ourselves to sort of drop our kind of maybe outside persona um mm. to sort of uh yeah maybe like become become more um sort of childlike and kind of uh yeah, yeah sort of explore life through that because yeah like you say sort of when you are a child often you're told that you know sort of don't be childish and things like that so yeah sometimes it's quite good to go back yeah mm. um so i was just going to bring up some uh comments that we've kind of had during the um show mm -hmm. so far and then we can sort sure. of um rift off of them if we want um so cheng says um i mean the um yeah uh, right the making of mistakes um in art and just painting over that's um actually something i struggle with and that's why i don't draw or paint perfectionism that makes me hate everything i do oh no jennifer that's really yeah. sad to um hear because you know i do mm, i do understand that yeah i mean i myself am my worst critic and whenever <laughs> somebody whenever there's somebody says, oh my god this is amazing or for example if i sell art i'm sort of i, I sort of want to ask are you sure you want to buy this you know are you sure yeah. about that it's like it's like but that's very insulting obviously because uh if they like it they like it that's fine and and even though i get um sometimes an acknowledgement of somebody else and i'm sure jennifer you have uh, gotten uh, an acknowledgement from other people who have seen your art and say oh this is great and so on and so forth i know it's difficult to allow this to, to you know for you to receive that and to really take it in but do try to do that because i mean I, I understand that you always think oh i could have done it better sure sure of course but let's look at where you are now and what you have done in the past let's look at mm. how you have improved over the over over time because i look at my art in the past and uh you know i look at some of the painting i thought oh my god okay fair enough you know and now i look at the sort of thing that i do and i'm i can see i have improved it has gone become better i still have this imposter syndrome or whatever it's called mm -hmm. where i think oh it's impossible you know i'm not an artist i didn't study or anything like that and um so i do understand that but i do very much hope that you take that to heart to uh, listen to the people around you who tell you that it is great. They're not. They're not saying like, for example, I would say to myself, they only say this because they feel sorry for me, or yeah. you know, um, they want to be polite. You know, just be very polite about it. You know, I mean, come on. If they if they like it, they they like it, and that's perfectly fine. And just accept that and and try to, you know, it's hard. I know, and I'm sure Claire, do you have anything like that as well that you have sort of you uh, yeah, say to yeah, yourself? Yeah. 
oh, come on, stop. It's not that great. You're, you're exaggerating <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, in particular, actually, when I started uh, teaching sewing um, skills, mm -hmm. it's sort of, you know, although I studied and I've got a degree in um, like sort of uh, making garments um, and I have made plenty of garments before, it's always that thing of I didn't study to become a teacher. So my sort of mm. teaching style is maybe um, a bit sort of off the cuff and more sort of how I learn. That's sort of how right. then I teach people um mm. then equally with my painting you know I I did study it um at college after school and did do it through school but um even at school sort of I got marked down on my GCSE because apparently I, I worked towards the wrong brief because <laughs> we had so many different teachers during our time so I've okay, always yeah. have kind of had that in the back of my mind plus I had like a teacher when I was at college that was like none of us will ever sort of become anything um oh, so it's right. only it's literally it's only been like this past what six months that I've actually been mm. exploring it properly that I've had this set up for me to explore yeah, yeah. more mm. um because I was always like oh, I don't have the room to do it or I'm not you know sort of why would I kind of spend time doing that and things like that? And again, it's like you finding, ex it's finding like, excuses. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. and it's giving mm. you that time. So now I sort of like, um, I try and give myself 30 minutes um, every single day to mm. do like a little bit of something. Um, yeah, yeah. So again, it's sort of what I was like saying before about kind of using acrylic as sort of a bit of a watercolor. Um, yeah to sort of kind of build up like my paintings a bit at a time because otherwise I become too kind of focusing on getting it done there and then and actually mm -hmm. then I find that that's sort of my worst work because I've um uh yeah sort of like that's when like my perfectionism takes over whereas yeah. sort of I find when I can come back to it every now and then I can see mm. it more clearly um yes, so yeah right. so I totally get that and yeah to sort of like anyone else out there I'm like I would say sort of have a go you know even if, if it's just like a paintbrush and sort of some paint on the uh kind of canvas or just you know sort of like a pencil on some paper um you know sort of whatever whatever scribbles you kind of make whatever lines you mm. you create um you know sort of take that as something you know like I'm not a I'm not a writer but it doesn't mm. mean that I just still don't journal and things like that, you know. So it's like right. we can all sure. kind of dipping in and out of these things and take from it mm. kind of what what it gives us in a way. You may yeah. not go on to sell something, but it, you still sure. will feel something from it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you don't have to follow certain things. You can just, as you said, take take what you can get from it and maybe take that and then take another thing and just put it together or whatever, you know, do things that the book tells you not to do and then just try yeah. it out, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so then her next comment was um, the pressure to be productive is something I can really relate to. I grew up feeling mm -hmm. that way and being pressured by my narcissistic parents um, to be that way. It wasn't in Scientology, just a high control environment um mm. and again sort of you know kind of um I've um sort of not been through kind of that uh sort of environment as a uh sort of on a large scale but there's been sort of different parts of my life that I um can kind of see that different things happened um mm. in terms of like other people trying to sort of uh influence control um yeah. and uh yeah so i think that that sort of um either sort of uh kind of me personally like having gone through situations where either like i need to always like be out of the house so then i'm i'm trying to like sort of make myself busy in other ways or kind of um having kind of worked on my business whilst also uh, working full time and then sort of coming to a point where then I'm able to work full time in my own business and then give myself some time off like actual days off yeah. it mm -hmm. it's that sort of 
uh, understanding that it's okay, you know, like sort of you were saying before, it's okay to give yourself time to, you know, sort of have a nap, to have a walk, to, uh, yeah. you know, sort of sit down and watch some TV, you know, sort of you don't have mm. to be on the go all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and I in think fact, that's... you will find, you will find if, if you give yourself time to just rest, to have a nap, to just watch a movie, it actually helps um, with the artistic uh, process for me or with work in general, because I, I'm able to just sort of clear my mind for a little bit, doing yeah. something where I don't have to think, like watching a movie, you don't have to think much or, you know, taking a walk. And it just sort of helps to clear, clear out the attic, so to speak. So not all of this, mm -hmm. oh, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to go over there. And just, that just sort of helps to clear it out. And then when you pick up your work or your painting or whatever, you look at it with fresh eyes because you didn't think about it all that the whole time. You were just able to sort of let go of it. And then you look at it with new eyes. And maybe a problem that you had, a solution might just pop up. That has been my experience with, with that sort of thing anyway. Yeah. So mm. I was uh, laughing during that because Jennifer's put up that I'm definitely a workaholic yeah and i need to have a spa yeah. day a spa. and that my buy me a coffee should be changed to buy me a spa day which i would love yeah. to um, <laughs> i have um yeah sort of like kind of in this new year um i've kind of uh given myself a, a spa one a spa day once a month um mm, so good. uh yeah so that's kind of something um something nice oh and hello maya um you have to go back and uh and watch replay if uh you can't go back at the moment but welcome um do you put any questions into the um chat um i'm just gonna have to run and grab myself a tissue so i do apologize but i'm gonna put That's, up whitney's yeah. message mm -hmm. as a next one um about her own perfectionism Right here. How is everyone doing, by the way? All right, sorry. I knew I'd um would do do uh one of the buttons wrong. Um Wonderful. So, um, Whitney, yes, uh, I feel the same about perfectionism makes me a chronic procrastinator um, because I can't get something perfect, working mm. hard to get to let go of that myself. Yeah, which I think yeah. is really good that sort of um, people kind of see that and and learn that it's OK, you know, sort of not to that you don't have to be on everything constantly yeah um and then she's saying um i'm so glad that you're out samuel um i'm able to be creative and true and your true self which is mm. yes. very yes i am very glad yes <laughs> it's uh i think it's it's one of them things that sort of like again kind of hearing people's stories you're kind of like you know, often people say, oh, you know, sort of, how comes like you were in whatever situation, you know, sort of domestic abuse or something as well. Um, mm -hmm. How like were you in that situation for so long? But it's always so easy to see that from the outside. And even as the person, once you're out, to think back on it. But when you're in that situation, you either don't realise that there's anything wrong mm -hmm. um, or, you know, sort of, can't see a way out so you know i think yeah. that's really sort of um important for people to sort of understand uh mm. when like they maybe haven't been through that exact um situation yeah. um because yeah i think it's, it's always so easy to to tell someone sort of what they should have done um and yeah rather than another kind of point understand and another point on that is is something that i came to realize is 
that, um, well, you already mentioned that you don't realize there's something wrong because, for example, in my case, I grew up in Scientology as a little child. And so I only knew that I had nothing to compare it with. I very much lived in a bubble and I didn't know how, how normal behavior is, basically. You know, my parents, they uh, treated me in a way as though I wasn't really their child. Because in Scientology, you believe you're a spiritual being that is millions of years old, has had thousands of, of lives, and therefore you've had thousands of fathers and mothers. And so that only your care caretakers. So there was always a very you know strong distance uh, between each other. And so I only I grew up like that way. And for me, that was just normal. It was just completely normal. And so it took me a while to um, realize that actually what was happening wasn't right. And I didn't realize that when I was there, but I do remember there were certain points where I thought to myself, I don't want to do anything about the situation because I am used to the suffering that I know, that I know now. I know this suffering now, and I'm scared to do something that might possibly relieve, relieve it or make it worse because I'm comfortable in this suffering that I know because I've had this suffering for so many years I know how to deal with it. And I was scared, not brave enough or whatever to try something out because there's, there might have been a possibility that things could have gotten better, but it could also have gotten much worse. And mm -hmm. so I much rather be in the, comf in the comfort of the uh, known suffering rather than be brave and try something else out. Um, yeah. I don't know if that is just a me thing or if, if I, other people have had that sort of thing as well in the same sort of context. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's really interesting. And um, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, like I say, sort of, I've not had sort of similar, uh, not had that exact, but yeah, sort of my kind of uh, lockdown experience in particular was sort of, uh, I say it's kind of, I it's sort of the, the nearest thing that I have. Um, and I was sort of uh, looking up a lot of sort of Scientology stuff before that um, in terms of the um, uh, documentaries that like Louis Theroux and things uh, did about it. So I was well aware of the um, abuses that went on, but it mm. wasn't until I had my own experience in lockdown and sort of feeling kind of caged in a situation um, of sort of how to move past it um, mm. that I was kind of listening to uh, kind of more podcasts on it and things like that that I sort of realized um, how you know how the sort of um, some of what I'd gone through was maybe sort of being mirrored um, in uh sort of understanding what like coercive control was and things like that you know mm, um mm. so yeah i think it's really um uh really um uh what's the word um yeah sort of kind of it it's easy to find yourself in that sort of situation um whether sort of boring or not um but yeah i think the 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 thought of being born into something um, is is a lot more obviously terrifying because, yeah, like if you don't know any different, then why would you yeah. even think to to leave? You know, because because you don't know what else is out there. In in an organization that's telling you that everyone else is evil, you know, it's right. Sort of, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very heartbreaking. Mm. Um. On a lighter Sorry. note, somebody asked, yeah. on a lighter note, Jennifer asked what kind of tea I'm drinking. I'm drinking lovely oh. chamomile tea, by the way. Oh, lovely. Nice, yeah. nice. She's also, uh, which I was going to bring up, she asked a question earlier. Um, for the chat and Samuel, not myself, I feel very offended, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? How very dare you? <laughs> Um, do you feel more at ease with relaxing and chilling now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, now I, I can do it without feeling guilty or, or sort of yeah. double, you know, question myself or whatever. I mean, sometimes 
I, th I think to myself, well, I really should be doing that. But I just sort of say, okay, well, I'm going to allow myself an hour of yeah. whatever it is that I want to do, read a book or whatever. And then after afterwards, I'll, I'll do whatever ha I have to do. I, I definitely, I can deal with it much better. And um, yeah, definitely. And yourself, Claire? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say sort of, I think that kind of given myself the uh, sort of time of like, I have to do at least like 30 minutes of painting a day. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah sort of again, mm. sort of helps with that sort of, it's okay, you know, like to give myself yeah, that yeah. time. Um, mm. And kind of often with that, either I'm watching something on YouTube or like listening to some music. I've been trying to get back into listening to music because again, I sort of, I find myself sort of getting in these like rabbit holes and sort of, I will, uh kind of binge watch things and things like that um, right yeah 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 mm -hmm. in and in kind of sometimes like a bit of a destructive way and that it kind of maybe sort of takes over my my life a bit too much so um and music is something that i really have been neglecting with myself so i've been trying to sort of listen to that a lot more um to sort of mirror in that like when i do my painting and then um yeah it kind of sort of gives myself uh some like headspace from everything Mm -hmm. um but yeah sort of and then like sort of the big days when I kind of um I go on my hikes um with like sort of an organized group and uh they are um sort of happen like maybe like twice um a month if I can um mm -hmm. and yeah so then that's kind of sort of more of just like a day out and then within them that's when I sort of do some uh, some of my photography to get sort of nice views and then I'll do some mm -hmm. paintings out of that so it's sort of like oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah it's all kind of uh, so sometimes I'm better at it than others you know <laughs> it depends sure, on what's of course. going on we can't be oh, we can't be fabulous every day no exactly <laughs> um, wonderful and then we've got a comment from Brad um saying um, i'm getting a lot of practice in and soon enough i will be able to do the painting i promised you so i do that mm. for you i don't know might be for me yes say about me yeah, well, yeah. But he's <laughs> he's gonna do well, your painting well. lovely yeah 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 he's he's uh, he's promised me a painting and uh and i said all right excellent and then i said i wanted well actually he showed me a painting he did and i really liked it and i said all right how much for it i'd like to buy it he said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I'm not going to I'm not gonna say <laughs> to you and so on and so forth. And I said, and, and then he also said, it's not good enough and so on and so forth. Going back to what we said earlier, I'm the, I'm the one looking his art. I think yeah. it's great. I'm not saying it out of politeness. Uh, I generally like it. Uh, otherwise, I would have just said, hmm, interesting, you know. Yeah. But I generally liked it, you know. And uh, and, and he, he, he didn't want to sell it. So we basically came to agreement. All right, well. I don't live far away. I live in Switzerland. That's also where I come from. And England isn't that far away. I'm sure I will come this year to visit England. I will oh, nice. visit him. And he, he, I'm going to give him one of my paintings. And then he's going to give me one of his paintings. Oh, wow. And so that's how like we're going to gonna pay, pay for each other's painting, basically. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, that's really cute. He said as well, um, I'd love you to do a painting um while listening to one of my favorite songs i'd love to see the outcome that would be really Absolutely. interesting brad what, uh, actually, what song actually, are you thinking I, you can yeah write it in the chat because i i, yeah. I asked him some days ago well what is your favorite song because that was very much my intention yeah right Mm. very nice yeah that'd be yeah that'd be really interesting to uh to sort of yeah kind of see that outcome as well um when if you said yes to painting swaps mm. really well that's what exciting. artists did in the past as well yeah yeah and uh just one from maya um she's put samuel are you german or danish and i'd like to say neither <laughs> yeah exactly Swedish. very much Swiss. <laughs> Oh, sorry, from the sorry, land yeah, of sorry, chocolate sorry. and cheese. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. Um, oh, um, Maya, I will put it back in the um, chat. 
but I will show you, we will go through some of his paintings again here. I know you came in a bit late. I was close though, <laughs> yeah. I was the one that got it very wrong. I always, uh, uh, right, let me put up his website again. There we go. Oh, we have an answer. Bohemian Rhapsody by, by Queen. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would be a really interesting one. Oh, Maya said that she loves your artwork. They are very, oh, very nice. Thank you very much. Um, there were some that I didn't quite catch when we were going through the other ones. Oh, no, maybe I did get them. We oh, here we go. The one from the thumbnail. The what? Sorry, the image or? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if if you if you meant that painting. You know, the one that you use for the thumb thumbnail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't um, bring that up as, uh, oh, as okay. uh, one one of the. Um, uh ones for, on the slide unfortunately i <laughs> missed that one off mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah so uh may was saying um uh this is um obviously sort of from when you were talking about uh being in sort of scientology and kind of that thing mm -hmm. of um the real world um she says that she can't wrap her head around um the feeling of not having the real world to compare to um yeah. yeah and i think that's sort of kind of what uh what a lot of people you know sort of don't understand like how because it it's so sort of normal for anyone that hasn't been in such a um closed off situation in that sort of sense mm. um you know sort of uh how you sort of can get yourself sucked into that sort of um well do not realize but you know i think it's sort of until you've you've had that happen um you know sort of i think it's always going to be quite hard for people to realize um, yeah sort of the the intensity of it um and then witness says um uh the known world is not as scary as the unknown world outside and I think that's, yeah. you know, that's yeah. very true for a lot of situations mm. um, when sort of people can't, can't understand it. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> Brad says, sorry in advance. Yeah, because it is, it is a, a massive, it's a massive song. So, yeah, uh, exactly. no, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It'll be interesting. Like, so yeah. what, what, part of the music um sort of mm -hmm. uh yeah sort of resonates with you more really exactly um, yeah mm -hmm. um yeah and then maya says that people born in have the hardest time leaving which is very true you know and it's sort of um mm. and i think you know it's kind of what is so shocking about people that kind of leave um uh, sorry who join who are not Belonging, you know because it's sort of you you know like being on the outside like we can see all the terrors that happen um but you mm -hmm. know they still weave their web with with the few people as well so yeah um it's one of those um yeah, i wish there were more people talking about that you know from ex who who went in when they were adults because yeah. we often hear hear about uh how i escaped how I got out, but so so little do we Why hear about did you how go did in? I get in? How did yeah. you get in? You know, because pe many people who talk about their the past in in Scientology, they were like in my case uh, second generation, so we were born into it. Like we didn't have anything to compare it with. We didn't make a conscious choice uh, to go and, and join that. So, you know, yeah, that's uh, and and it sort of goes for like other groups, like sort of next year, of course, and kind of. These yes. uh, ones that have sort of started since, like online and things, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 
that it's sort of uh, what what makes people kind of join those um, and also yeah. sort of join for so long. Um, mm. I actually sort of, uh, so my kind of tipples with a few things like that is um, that there's uh, a girl that I knew for quite a while through the um, sort of sustainable um, and kind of small business sort of sectors. And she's a very lovely girl. She's from up north, very chatty. But oh my God, like she could she could sell anything to anyone. And right. we went out for dinner one one night. And it was whilst I was like doing my business and um sort of and working full time at the same time. And something had come up and I'd said something about like not having the money to do whatever. Mm -hmm. Um I can't remember if it was like something particular to do with my business or something else. Anyway, we went out for dinner and uh, she's talking to me about, oh, you know, sort of, um, I'm doing this, uh, like selling this um, stuff with a company called Arbon. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And she's like, oh, you know, sort of like, because like, if you don't have much money, then like, it's quite quick to sort of earn some money, blah, blah, blah. And she sort of explained it to me. And she kept going mm -hmm. on about wanting some car that, you know, she would be on like the next level to get or something like that. Right. And I okay, didn't really okay. sort of think too much about it. My mm -hmm. grandma has always done um, Avon. And uh, so when I sort of had tried a bit of that, I didn't quite get on with it. Um, but I was like, you know, sort of this is like uh, meant to be sort of uh, eco-friendly stuff and uh, I was like you know sort of I'll kind of give it a go if anything just for like me to get like discount on this product and sort of use yeah. it um, yeah. so I sort of got it and then like I told like a few friends about it and they all sort of kind of poo-pooed it and they were like no 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 you know like, we don't we don't want it and I was like oh you know like, just get your discount sort of thing not even really thinking about the fact that when they buy I get something from it Right, yeah. Because equally, I wasn't thinking about, yeah, and equally, I wasn't thinking mm. about when I buy, my friend was then getting stuff from me. Yeah. But yeah. she was, but she was, and she kept saying to me, and she was like, oh, you know, like, you need to do a party next, you need to do this. And it was all like sort of uh, like the party pack kind of that you would get was the, you know, X mm. amount of hundreds of pounds. And I was like, I said, but like when we spoke before, like I said, I didn't have the money to do whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So I still don't have the money to to buy this stuff to like you know to do this party that like you keep pressuring me to do. Yeah. And but she because like, she's selling it as an investment, probably like if you pay, yeah, well, you, you you might you might pay now five hundred pounds for it, but once you sell it all, you know you're gonna end up with two thousand pounds or whatever. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and because yeah. I'm, you know, I was sort of kind of full like so far. But, you know, that she was, she, like, when people sort of put that kind of pressure on me, I'm just like, I kind of zone out and mm. I'm like, no, no, no. Mm. Yeah, and I yeah. was just like, no, you know, because I'm not a, a salesy person, you know, so she's mm. very, very much yeah. in that. And I was like, I've never ever been that. So, you know, sort of, it's not, it's not going to work for me. Um, and, and I literally, I just like, it sort of didn't speak to her for ages. I sort of, I stopped getting this stuff. Um, mm. because actually then I did some more research into it and found out it wasn't actually as eco-friendly as what she was making out. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, then she eventually came back to me, like, maybe a year later or something, and was like, oh, I've just some, I've just found out that, like, that, that thing I was doing was, was like, a, a pyramid scheme and all this, suddenly everyone mm. and MLM. And I was like, and, and it wasn't very eco-friendly. And I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> I just yeah. kind of, although, like, I never sort of said it to her in that, like, you know, maybe this is a bit of a scammy thing. But I was trying to be, like, you know, sort of a nice kind of... Yeah, polite about it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, maybe it's not, like, mm. all that you're sort of making out. And she was like... But she was like, and she was like proper in, like she was all like going to the conferences and being like mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. really wanting to get this car. And I was just like, can't yeah. you like see, like how do you think you're going to, like that they're, they're just going to give you away some car, you know? So it's sort of, yeah. um, in terms of things like that, you know, sort of I 
I understand very well how easy it is because she was such a, a good she could just talk you around to doing anything um and and it sort of shocked me in a way sort of how easy it was um that she kind of did that to me even though sort of you know mm. I didn't spend all the money and do all this and the other you know I still kind of brought into it so it's sort of yeah, yeah, um yeah. it unfortunately it's made me a lot more skeptical about a lot more people um but yeah I try and sort of kind of uh, go into a lot more sources um uh before sort of making like to like do my own research like before making a final sure. decision on anything yeah. but yeah. um but yeah so it's sort of that kind of interest of um I suppose kind of sort of uh how how much it's sort of um quickly sort of people let down their defense on that sort of mm. um like when someone is kind of talking them around to it um yeah. because I think it's um uh yeah sort of like sometimes a bit we we think you know sort of like so many people always say that they they would never get caught out by these things but mm -hmm. I'm sure you know they've probably all have been sucked in by something like that you yeah. know um you know an advert to buy something you know that's exactly the same thing yeah. you might not be yeah. um part of a unknown cult but you know sort of like um fast fashion is uh as i kind of say is is a bit of a cult in a way in that sort mm. of we are we are led to believe that we need to keep buying these clothes yeah. yet um you know do you really like sort of uh kind of when when was the last time that you threw something away because it actually had a hole in it versus yeah. when was the last time that you sort of gave something away because you um it, like it still had the tags on it or something like that you know it's sort mm. of, we kind of forget those things yeah, yeah absolutely um, often and um intel intelligent has nothing intelligence has nothing to do with being sucked into a con conversive um um what's the word um coercive control co uh, coercive yeah coercive control group uh pyramid scheme or anything like that um because they're trying to get you when you're vulnerable when when you when you need something when you're down on your luck or whatever uh yeah. and then that's how how it often starts uh, they try to sell you sell you a piece of blue sky they yeah. try to sell you something that you know, a parry will make everything better, but you just have to, you just have to invest here. You just have to give us your time. You just have to do this and that and that. And maybe eventually you might get there and uh, mm. they will gaslight you and telling you, oh no, we never really said that, you know? And, um, you know, when you say, well, didn't you tell me, I, didn't you promise me this that, and the other? And then they will gaslight you and say, oh, we didn't never say, we only said you might get to that point and so on and so forth. And uh, it just, goes on and on and on and on and then you know it can get pretty bad exactly that's the thing and it's mm. sort of you know i think it's it's important that we don't um that we don't sort of berate ourselves for getting into such situations sure. but yeah, equally absolutely. to understand just how easy it is um and maybe yeah. look at us for ourselves for uh maybe why that was easy for us to get into it you know sure. it's sort of, yeah, yeah. um reflect kind reflect of, and see yeah you know mm -hmm. sort of like it, it's what i sort of went through like even like sort of when i kind of she did that to me mm -hmm. i sort of realized that i was um you know sort of i wasn't doing that extra homework that extra sort of due diligence on myself mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. around sort of kind of what people were telling me and things like that um so yeah so I think, uh, you know, we can always kind of learn from these things. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I wanted to say hello to Chad, who has just joined us. Oh, hello there. Clear water chat. Do, um, do check the replay, Chad. Um, and thank you very much for reminding people to hit the like button. Marvellous, yes. That's right, yeah. Um, hit like and subscribe. Yes, yes. Um, and actually, I realised because um, I didn't actually realise that you had a YouTube channel. 
Um, so I don't ah, actually yeah. have that up. Um, ah, yeah. So uh, what are you on YouTube? And I will. Uh, well, the S VSP chef. Oh, lovely. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I already started the, the channel like, I don't know, two weeks ago, something like that. Oh, fun. Yeah. But I've already put a, a bunch of, of videos up there. So I'm basically talking about my own life in Scientology, the things I've seen and witnessed and things that have happened to me, you know, my, my journey through that and all of that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I like it. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to subscribe. Yeah. Oh, I need to sign in. Okay, I will. I will do it afterwards. Mm. Um, sure. The way the way you're not you're not signed in on the computer. Uh, right. Let me go. Let's put that in the chat. So everyone, please go and um, subscribe to uh, Samuel, the SP Chef. Um, I was looking um up before um and um may was saying that she was always uh, dragged into a clinging product pyramid squid scheme mm. um yeah. thank god that she's not into clinging <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, which is kind of buggy um but yeah you know it's it's so uh you know because obviously sort of like even like my mum's um sort of generation it was all like the Tupperware parties and things oh, like yeah. that. And then, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, totally. and then there was sort of the, um, and some of us, like, sort of when I was like at school, like, pe like kids, like, were always talking about that because of their parents or whatever. Um, mm. And then obviously, like, from that, then, like, you get like Avon as well, which obviously have always been like, oh, we're not like a pyramid skiing scheme. Yeah. But obviously, there is, you know, there is always something like that, you know, to it. Yeah. And even in Scientology, um, there is a, this pyramid scheme because yeah. in the sense of if you if you sell, if you bring somebody new into Scientology, uh, you sort of become their buddy in a sense. And for the rest of that time, when they do anything in Scientology, any courses or anything like that, you get a small percentage of that. And so it is, mm. of course, out of your interest to get that person to spend as much money as possible there yeah and if you if you're good at that sort of thing you might have a hundred different people that uh you got into scientology to do courses and things like that and uh you know you can you can generate a, a nice little income by doing that at least that yeah. was at the time when i was in in 2012 um, and yeah. i don't know if it's still now in theory it mm. should be because it is policy uh policy meaning it is it is written by the founder aaron hubbard and whatever he writes to do, you have to do, which is why wow. Scientology oftentimes is very old fashioned in certain things, because uh, Hubbard, he was born in 1911. So there are certain things like like the Internet or, or mobile phone that didn't exist during his time. So there's no policy about that. So mm. I recently, for example, did, uh, did a video on my channel where I was trying to get in contact with my local church, uh, Church of Scientology here in Switzerland. And it was a back and forth, back and forth. In the end, uh, they told me the best way to get in contact is to write a letter. And and they will be sending telexes. You know, they're talking about sending telexes, That's writing crazy. letters. It's just so but they can't they can't change it because they're not allowed to change whatever the, the founder wrote. So it's a bit you know, uh, which again you know. is like such a rant because yeah i just think like sort of anyone that kind of gets in like later in life especially like you know sort of in kind of the internet age mm. is sort of you know do they not sort of then question that sort of um yeah going into somewhere where sort of the internet isn't a thing as such yeah um yeah, yeah. the you know sort of <laughs> god only knows as such um mm. Maya has asked are you actually a chef i and am I that you are mm -hmm. um and uh, kind of within that maybe sort of has um your chefing and art kind of careers um do, like do they ever collide and sort of they the did other? they did in a way because when i uh was studying for myself buying books and learning how to make uh paints and things like that 
I actually made a kind of uh, paint based on the chemistry that you learn in, in culinary school. Wow. So how you make, for example, mayonnaise, the way you make mayonnaise is you take an egg yolk and then you add, you might add a bit of mustard, salt, pepper and so on and so forth. And then you add oil, vegetable oil, while you beat the egg yolk. And this helps to the whole thing to bind and to thicken and it uh, stays together because normally oil and fat, they don't mix. And eh, not oil and fat, sorry. Um, um, oil and the vinegar and things like that. Because oh, yeah. obviously in the mayonnaise, you will add a bit of vinegar. Or for example, you have a French salad dressing. Uh, do you know, I don't know a French salad dressing, if that's something in, in England. Yeah, we call yeah. it French so, here. It's yeah, a milky it's looking of, one. It separates, yeah. It separates because of the of the of the vinegar and the oil, and so you add egg yolk, and egg yolk helps to bind the whole thing together. So I used right. that, and I sort of I made a mayonnaise. I used I made basically a mayonnaise and added uh, color pigments to it, so to try these sort of things out. And then I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if I used the whole egg, right? So I yeah. had uh, the egg yet yeah, the egg <laughs> white. So I thought, all right, that's fine. I'll just make a white omelet out of it. I can eat it. And then I looked at the shells and I thought, what can I do with the shells? And then I just ground them up in a very, 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 very fine powder to use as a white color pigment. Wow. And that sort of started me using other materials. I used shells from uh, peanuts. Um, I used shells from, um, well, not the shells, but the peels of onions. Because oh, when yeah. I was a child for Easter, we would color eggs with uh, yeah, using the dye. Using the dye of onion peels, right? We would yeah. throw onion peels in a pot and then that's how we would dye. And then I would use that. And then it sort of, it just sort of came from that. And then I started using metals and things like that. And that's how I came to use all these random materials in, in oh, into that. Because these are materials that, uh, like at one time I walk, I, I took a walk and, um, there were uh, a tree was cut down and then there was lots of uh, wood um, oh, dust, yeah. you know, like the chip when, when you, yeah. the chippings. And I just took some of that and then I used that in art. So I used things that may be no. thrown away or I used yeah. the polystyrene. I, I, I bought something, yeah. whatever it was, it, it was polystyrene. And rather than throwing it away, I paint on that. And so That's I had cool. a, a, a painting, you know, very thick polystyrene that I, I just painted on that and just, uh, sort of try to use things that normally you would throw away because in the kitchen that's something you learn as a chef to to have as little waste as possible to really use everything as much as you can the whole animal all of the the whole vegetable the peel of it you can use things mm. you can do things with that because obviously uh, your profit margin is very small and you really want to make sure you use all of that and it's very important to do that and yeah. I try to use that as well then in my art. So that's sort of how it sort of collides, how it sort of works together in that sort of way. Yeah, for sure. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Maya said that she would, um, that would make an amazing art chef video. <laughs> yes, I, I have, I have thought about of, of, uh, of doing a little bit, not, I mean, if I were to do a sort of like tutorial, cooking tutorial, I wouldn't be like, okay, today we're going to do a, a roast duck. I would because yeah. I think there's so many there's so many um, uh, YouTubers who who do that and they do a great job. Uh, but what I think would be more interesting to talk about the technique, the chemistry behind it, to really yeah. explain why if you have a pan at a certain temperature and then you add something, why does it become brown? Like why is how yeah. why does that happen? That's and if you understand that, you can use that it, that knowledge to transfer to other things. Yeah. In the same way, if you have, if, if you learn how to uh, take apart an animal, you understand how the sinew is of the different parts of the animal because of how the animal moves, what muscles it uses, which means yeah. if you then are giving a, given a piece of meat from a different animal, you know from whereabout it is because you understand exactly how it works. The same when you have a recipe of, of a certain, of how to cook a certain vegetable, and you like the recipe, you like the spices that I use, the technique, but maybe you don't like that vegetable. Well, let's find out what family this vegetable is from so that you can use the same recipe, but on a different vegetable from the same family. 
because oh my god that's so fascinating yeah because obviously you have different textures of vegetables and and some and and the different textures one vegetable you have to cook for 20 minutes the other vegetable you only need five minutes so you won't yeah. be able to do the same thing because otherwise one might be cooked well the other one will be completely overcooked overdone. yeah overdone because they're not they don't have the same structure they're not part of the same uh botanical family and so I, if I were to do that, I would do something like that. Uh, Love it. But Love it. Uh, yeah, I, I I haven't really, you know, not, because it is yeah, very, very complicated. It it's not visual. Yeah. It's not very visual. It's a bit difficult with cooking. You can see what's happening, and the other one is a lot of technical uh, things. You know, like or like how to make sauces, like the 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 the, the oh, basic yeah. recipes of that. And if you really understand the basis of it, you can make. Uh, variations from it you can add mm -hmm. certain spices to it and then make variations from it rather than learn uh, the 20 different sources from from one particular ground source if you learn the ground source you can do the other 20s much easier because you know the basic of that rather than okay. having to learn every yeah. single time it and you and that is the sort of thing i would want to do um but you know i it's it's something I'm I'm thinking about. It's in the works, and uh, we'll see. But I'm sure I'm going to do something like that in the future. Yeah. Yeah. If of course people are interested in that. Yeah. Now that sounds absolutely fascinating. Mary said that her mind is blown. Um, <laughs> I hope in so, a good yeah. way. I think. Yeah. We exactly. Have to, we have think, to pull yeah. The yeah. No, yeah. Not blown no. off. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she said um, it's a bit like color theory um, right. you know and i think mm. i think it's you know it's sort of um particularly sources like as soon as you said that yeah it's like sort of really understanding like the fund fundamentals of a source sort of it's yes. makeup and maybe in particular sort of why you would use a particular source uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think is um, yeah. Because if you really understand it, you can about. start inventing things. You can start inventing yeah. recipes because you understand what each individual ingredient does. Because if you don't understand it, you just do it. It works. But if if you're then in the kitchen and there is an ingredient missing, you can't do it. You can't make yeah. the sauce because you don't really understand what the, each ingredient does. And that's some. That's I think what makes a chef a chef. And what's the difference between a chef and a cook, maybe? That mm. a chef is able to, on the cuff, be able to um, just, if something is missing, an ingredient is missing, if a guest says, I want this, but I'm allergic to dairy, I can't have nuts or whatever, then you, can't, then you can say, all right, no problem, we have this, we can use instead, we can use that instead, because, you know, it has the same texture, it has the same sort of, it goes in the same direction of flavor, and you're able to then, invent things because you really understand what each each ingredient does and the same thing with art if you really understand color theory uh, and and uh, the different materials that you use and things like that it um you know you can really you can make things up in your head sort of like a mathematical theory and then it's a mm. theory and then you do it and then you can see if it actually works you know because for me yeah. cooking it's it's nothing more than mathematics and chemistry you know that's that's for exactly. me it's that's how how cooking is for me and that's how i look at cooking naturally there has to be a, an artistic aspect to it there has to be a certain amount of love and care for it which is why i don't think that the, the the job of a chef will ever vanish regardless of how mm. advanced our technology will be because there is something about uh, adding is it i mean if you have 10 chefs that have all this they have all the same recipe the same ingredients the same pots and pans and everything the same amount of time the dish is going to come out in 10 different ways because each chef will do it something slightly different will add an ingredient maybe 10 minutes earlier than the other the heat will be slightly hotter there than there because of all of their experience in life and things like that yeah Definitely, yeah. I think, yeah, that's, um, yeah, really, really interesting that we're sort of uh, gotten on to sort of uh, cooking side of things, um, yeah. but then also sort of linking it back to art. And mm. and even sort of, as you said that, I can see it's the same with how I think about sort of constructing a garment in right. the, um, pattern making is very sort of mathematical and mm. you have to mm. be very precise. But sort of once you get that, 
bit block you can kind of turn it into whatever you want yeah. um but it's sort of understanding the fundamentals of how a garment is put together and then sort of how it looks 3d mm. um yeah sort of you can then sort of uh look at how to sort of deconstruct it and sort of uh change change the um uh the styling of of something so uh yeah so i really that really really resonates with me that you can kind of see that with cooking and i can see that mm. with um with sort of uh sewing and garment construction um but then and i can imagine that bring it back into art and but i can imagine also for example if if you if you make a garment and you have different kinds of materials that you use that they will act and react differently to heat for example if yeah. you if you wash it it might shrink so maybe the stitching i mean i have no idea but i'm assuming that the stitching has to be done different in a way to compensate for if you if you're washing it if you if heat goes onto it or something that the stitching yeah. uh, works with it rather than uh, restrain it and then might be you know something happens like that so that's yeah, also exactly. you need to have a lot of technical understanding of that sort of thing to be able to yeah. really do that. Yeah. 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 So particularly when you're sort of kind of molding like two different types of fabrics together, like sewing mm. them in one mm. garment or yeah, sort of um, the way sort of uh, the direction that you cut a, um, a garment on the cloth um will sort right. of change then how it sort of reacts again like sort of like you say sort of when you wash it and things like that um, mm, yeah, yeah so it's uh yeah sort of it's interesting it's sort of the more you kind of um kind of delve into these subjects the more you sort of realize how they all kind of sort of weave through each other um yeah, yeah. in a way so yeah it's really mm -hmm. interesting well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been such a fascinating um, chat. Yeah. And uh, really yeah, interesting, I feel like yeah. we can sort of, um, you know, kind of delve into more um, about sort of art styles and things um, at, uh, at another time. But uh, mm. yeah, if anyone else has got any um, questions, you can pop them in the chat. Otherwise, we will uh, wrap up for tonight. Thank you so much for um, being here. Um, and obviously, sort of, um, if you have anything else that you want to sort of add, uh, Samuel, sort of do. Um, but yeah, I've got no other questions. You've sort of answered answered a lot within all of this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It was a fascinating chat. Also, interesting questions from the chat and from yourself. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's, it's sort of this is my like. Um, uh, uh, of imposter syndrome is kind of um, doing all this stuff on, on YouTube and things. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I really like sort of um, educating people, uh, particularly around the sort of um, fashion stuff. And obviously, that's kind of where I feel more at home. Um, sure. But this kind of delving into art stuff is uh, is really, you know, sort of obviously it's it's, it's another kind of uh, passion of mine, and I really enjoy yeah. it. Enjoy it. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I really. You know, I appreciate obviously Brad for um, reaching out to me, and then you reaching out to me um, from Brad's um, from Brad's chat. So uh, yeah, yeah, sort of, I really appreciate it. And obviously, um, if anyone else wants to uh, wants to come along and and uh, have a little chat, then uh, then do do get in touch, um, and we can sort of arrange that. Um, oh, bless me. <laughs> Setting a happy spot. Oh, thank you so much. But yeah, I I get like super nervous doing this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, me too. Yeah, me I mean, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stage fright slightly, but you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's so nice, sort of. You know, obviously, when when you're chatting with someone that's so so nice as yourself, Samuel. So thank you so yeah. much. Um, and obviously, <laughs> and obviously, all of our lovely people in the um chat and we play crew um love you um and obviously i always get told off uh, by jim for not saying i love everyone that's in the chat as well um so thank you all so much um we need to have an our oh, brad is standing we need to have an artist stream three or four artists um, you know what? It's it is hard enough for me to keep up when I do the one with uh, yeah. Mayor and um, Heather on a Monday. So you know, so 
<laughs> I, I, I kind of like it one to one. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because particularly um, when you have four artists, they're all a little chaotic. I mean, artists are a little chaotic yeah. all over the place, and it's sort of. It, it, I think with four people or more, I think it could be for me a little be. overwhelming. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I'm very sort mm. of. Um, uh, yeah, you know, sort of kind of, I, I've uh, not been sort of kind of tested for ADHD, but um, I do sometimes kind of those sort of environments kind of bring out sort of tendencies mm, like that. Sure, um, sure. So, yeah, I kind of find it hard to hard to concentrate sometimes. Um, I mean, it, it's hard enough kind of doing kind of this with you and then sort of like looking at the chat and things like that so uh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. thank you <laughs> thank you um to everyone and when it says uh, great discussion thank you so much witness um yeah. thank you for watching wonderful and um i'll just put up my little banger to make sure that everyone has liked the um stream and do go over and check out check out um uh, Samuel's channel, I will also put that in the description for anyone that hasn't been here in the live chat. Um, and yeah, so please um, do go and subscribe to uh, both channels if you so like. And uh, yeah, we will um, see everyone next time I do one of these. <laughs> um, I'm actually, what I will say is um, next weekend, I believe we're going to do it. Um, I'm going to be chatting to Jennifer um, about her um, sort of past with uh, fashion um, and clothing and kind of her relationship in that sort of sense. So um, yeah, so that will be really fun. Um, so do check out for when um, uh, when that stream is going to be up. Um, I'm going to be doing a Monday stream on Monday, um, but Maya and heather my well to do check out um sort of go and check them out for whether they do do a stream um but otherwise i will be back on wednesday with whitney for our um dark side of fashion um where i believe we're going to be um tackling wool but uh i will i will <laughs> confirm with whatever the thumbnail is that i put up um so uh yeah so i will see everyone then thank you so much samuel and Thank you for having me. Say goodbye.